Hi, I'm Darren Llewellyn. Let's talk about electrical stuff. What I want to talk about today is energized electrical work permits and what a great thing that they can be for your facility and how they can really help your electrical safety program. Now, they're in Article 130, Chapter uh, 1 of, of 70E. They come right after, and this is important, they come right after the part that says you should achieve an electrical safe work condition, that is lockout, tag out, prior to you working on electrical circuits. They come after the next part, which is justifying you, justifying doing live electrical work. There's three ways to do it, and they match what OSHA says. You could do live electrical work if it creates a greater hazard to turn the panel off. Let's say that panel controls uh, air ventilation in a hazardous area. Maybe it controls life support systems at a hospital. Maybe it controls alarm systems at a hotel or a hospital, uh, things like that. So those situations, you can't turn off that panel. You're justified to work that one live by, that re by the reason of it creates a greater hazard. Another reason is if it's infeasible. If you just can't turn it off because what you want to do, it has to be live. For instance, voltage testing. You're allowed to test live voltage. You're allowed to do live troubleshooting. Those kind of things have to be done, of course, live. So in feasibility, the third reason is if it's 50 volts or below, you're okay to do energized work. So energized electrical work permit comes after lockout, tag out, doing that, achieving electrical safe work condition. It comes after you justifying work and now we've got energized electrical work permit. If you've justified doing this live work, then you need to do paperwork. Having this documentation is a big help and increases safety. Now, before we go any further, let's talk about the exemptions to energized work permit. You don't have to have a permit to do voltage testing, to do troubleshooting, to do thermography, those kinds of things, you that's an, there's an exemption. Can you imagine have to getting if you're a electrical repair person on the manufacturing floor or in a building, uh, you know, facility maintenance jobs like that? Can you imagine having to get an energized work permit for every time you have to check voltage somewhere, every time you have to do troubleshooting? It would be that would be a lot of paperwork. So there's exemptions from those. Now, what goes into an energized electrical work permit? Several things. You have to describe the equipment and the circuit that you're going to be working on. Right near the top, you have to write down, document the reason that you are justifying doing this live work. Justification has to be spelled out in writing. You have to put down what is the safe work practices you're going to be using? What is the results of the arc flash assessment that you've done? Have you done an incident energy analysis? What are those numbers? What is the results of the shock hazard assessment? What PPE will you need to be using for arc flash and shock protection? What are the boundaries? What are the limited, restricted approach boundaries for that piece of equipment at that voltage? What is the arc flash boundary for that piece of equipment based on your assessments? While you're doing this live work, you have to either have a boundary, some tape around with some, some things, barricades not to let people in there. Maybe you're going to use an assistant or two to keep people away while you're doing this work. You have to spell out how you're going to limit access to this equipment. Down toward the bottom, you got to get signatures. Now, your electrical safety policy needs to spell out who has to sign off on an energized electrical work permit. And a lot of times, you know, when it comes to getting a signature from a plant manager, a safety person, or, or you know, people in authority, they're not really willing to put their signature on this unless all your ducks are in a row. So make sure you get these signatures. Now, there is a sample for an energized work permit 
in the back of 70 in NXJ. There is also a really cool flow chart. I mean, if a flow chart could be cool, it's a flow chart of when all the steps and the decisions that you make when you're filling out an energized work permit. Also online, you'll find just Google, uh, go to a search engine and, you know, look up energized electrical work permit samples, you know, samples of energized work permits and a lot of IBW locals, a lot of universities have their permits online. There are manufacturing facilities, not as many of those as there are universities, but I'm not saying go there and copy what they've done. Go there and steal what they've done. Get some ideas what other people, um, because they're not all the same. I know Purdue University has a lot of information online and, and, and has a good permit. Vermont, uh, University of Vermont has a good one, and, and other universities too. Uh, Michigan, for instance, has a good one. So go there and look at these and get some ideas because you need to create one of your own. It can be based on what the one is in 70, but you can put your own, uh, your own twist on it and uh, make sure and spell out who has to sign it at the bottom. You don't want to, um, you know, just use what they've got on there. You may not have that title or position. So put your own positions uh, who has to sign off on this. When is electrical energized work permit required? When you're going to cross the restricted approach boundary and you're not going to be doing troubleshooting, testing, voltage testing, thermography, those things that we talked about, when you're going to cross that line and you're going to do something to alter the circuit. Now what might that be? Um, let's say that you've noticed you've got some loose lugs uh, on a motor starter. Maybe you've got a problem with a relay. Maybe it's even an ice cube relay, one that you can pull out, put, put another one in there. That's altering the circuit. Maybe it's changing bad heaters on a motor starter. Those are small, pro small changes, but it's still altering the circuit and would require energized electrical work permit. What I've told people for years is you need to have a really good energized work permit program and hopefully you never use it. Hopefully you never use it. Hopefully you can always figure out how to do these changes by shutting down the equipment. That's the goal. That's OSHA's goal. That's 70E's goal is to not do the live work, not to change these parts not to tighten these lugs, not to do those things live, to turn it off. Until next time, I'm Darren Llewellyn. Thank you for watching.